please enter the conference pin number. Please enter the conference pin number. I'm trying. No. Well, we gotta fix our little thing. Add on I know. I'm up behind. So. Is it connected? Oh no! It'll go. So I'll do this here. And then what happening is it? It's keep trying to connect here, and then that just disconnects. <coughs> Please enter the conference yeah, pin number. Yeah, go ahead. Please enter the conference pin number. Yeah, I know. It's... What's the, the little person? Yeah, there's more people in. Yeah, like Shannon's in, Dutch comms, is that you? Please enter yeah. the conference okay, pin number. Upstairs. Yeah. And I'm in. Is it not set up with the right code, maybe? No, it's going in. Yeah. No errors. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be connected to the TV. Oh. Well, Kim yeah. says she can hear me. Is she in her office? Or online? I just turned the mic on, so.
Good evening. I now call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations back to order. My name is Frieda Marzellos and I am the MLA for Tabacha and Chair of the Committee. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast and live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. To respect physical distancing requirements, non-committee members and the Official Language Commissioner will be attended by video conferencing. Tonight, committee will be hearing from Shannon Galberg, the Official Language Commissioner. This is the first step of the committee's mandated review of the Official Languages Act. We are also reviewing two annual reports from the Official Languages Commissioner. Good evening, Mrs. Galberg. Before you begin your opening remarks, I would just like to discuss how the meeting will proceed. All comments, questions, and remarks should be directed to myself as the chair. Both members and witnesses will need to wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking. This process is required to allow the committee clerk to turn on and off people's microphones. Mrs. Goldberg, do you have some opening remarks? The floor is yours. Go ahead. Sorry, I apologize. I should have waited. I do have some opening remarks. Uh, my opening remarks are actually a bit lengthy um, because, as I understood it initially, um, as you and as you've stated this evening, this is part of the review of the Act. So I did want to take this opportunity, being that it, it is my last opportunity, to highlight what I see as some of the um, issues with the legislation and, and, and hopefully provide my views on some of the things that this committee should consider moving forward. So if I'm speaking too long, uh, certainly uh, feel free to cut me off, but I did want to um, use this opportunity for that. And I thank the committee and I welcome the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, and as I said, wanted to focus on potential amendments to the Act. I want to start by saying, in my opinion, and this is an opinion that's been held by language commissioners in the past, the Act does not work. When the Official Languages Act was passed in 1984, it was modeled heavily, if not exclusively, on the Federal Official Languages Act. We all know there was political pressure by the federal government to pass the Act, and in my opinion, that failure to consider a made in North approach to the creation of legislation had a domino effect that continues to this day. The Act does not meet the need of, needs of Northerners. And as the Act is reviewed, I hope you'll go beyond the line by line or band aid approach to the legislation and instead consider the philosophical underpinnings of the Act. In this regard, these are some of the considerations as I see them. The first consideration has to do with what languages should be covered by the legislation as official languages. This may seem self-evident, but I don't believe enough consideration has been given to the issue. For example, my friend Vance Sanderson in Fort Smith has done considerable work on the history of the Michif language, and there is a group that has been advocating for years that Michif should be included as an official language of the Northwest Territories. That is, it was a language that was historically spoken in the southeast corner of the territories. In addition, we know that while we have tried to neatly divide the indigenous languages of the Northwest Territories into nine distinct languages, some elders would say that some of the dialects of those languages are actually distinct languages. Obviously, we cannot and should not come to conclusions regarding these issues tonight. Further, in my opinion, these issues require significant consultation with communities and elders, but these issues should be given the attention they deserve. Secondly, 
there needs to be serious consideration given to whether there should be any distinction in the rights as between English and French and the indigenous languages protected under the Act. Right now, the Official Languages Act gives greater rights to English and French than to the indigenous official languages. English and French have equality, and that's been made clear in court decisions and with languages commissioning. The indigenous languages have rights that are limited by designated areas, by whether there is significant demand, and due to the nature of the office. In my opinion, it is unconscionable in 2020 that language rights are limited in this way, particularly in the Northwest Territories. First, as we know, indigenous languages are dying, and limiting their rights it further erodes those languages and their future health. We only have to look at the Gwich'in language as an example of this. It is heavy, heavier in a, the northwest corner of the territories with few speakers and it's dying. To continue to keep it in that corner, in that box, does nothing to preserve and promote that language. You need to be proactive, not reactive. I liken it to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Bill C-92, and Indigenous children uh, being dealt with by the Director of Child and Family Services, and to other initiatives that attempt to address the wrongdoings towards Indigenous persons. This has to include the preservation of culture and language. We cannot justify legislation that has the effect of treating the Indigenous official language, language as a second rate. As stated by Yamamoto, when power differences are not severe, Milder forms of acculturation usually take place as cultures intermingle. More frequently, however, the weaker group has to unilaterally adjust and assimilate into the dominant culture, either voluntarily or by force. In the majority of such contact settings, language shift occurs. And I want to point out that that would apply to the French language as well. A second reason for ensuring Indigenous languages are treated equally to English and French is current technology. It's much easier to provide services in a number of ways, connecting with translators and interpreters remotely and through various mediums, use of services such as telehealth and can talk, phone apps. There is no excuse. The next thing that needs to be considered are what rights should be captured by the app. So this is a difficult issue that requires significant consultation. What I can tell you is that, in my experience, the expectation of the public is reasonable. That is, they want to be able to obtain essential services in the various official languages, healthcare, social services, housing, identification, motor vehicles, and dealing with elected officials. Again, it is my opinion that it is imperative to connect with communities and elders to establish these priorities. It's also important to look at the scope of the rights. Right now, uh, our legislation does not cover all government institutions. Uh, for example, the Power Corporation. I actually done a presentation to the Power Corporation, even though they aren't currently covered, an expectation that someday they might. And they were very interested in knowing what the act look, looks like, what does it do. So we need to give consideration to what those institutions are that are covered. We also need to consider language of work uh, and whether, again, um, the, the legislation should cover not just employees, but government contractors. And should it be more broad than government and agencies and go into the private sector? I'm not sure to smush that all together, but my point is these are significant issues. And that I would recommend that if any of these measures are contemplated, there be extensive consultation with community, business, and likely the need of the government, which, as you know, has implemented some of these broader terms. And we know they had growing pains but we also know that it has successes. 
One of the most important considerations, in my opinion, is how these rights, whatever they look like after your review, how will they be honored? And I've already alluded to this. Once a determination is made with respect to what rights there are, how do we make sure it works? The Act provides no specifics on how services will be provided. And while the official languages, policy, and guidelines are in place, they rarely seem to have any impact and they are not legislation. In my opinion, there needs to be a comprehensive overhaul of how services will be provided. There needs to be a full audit and review of active offer services in all languages. My experience makes it clear that active offer isn't working. Employees need to feel the importance of that, understand the importance of that active offer, and they have to be feel comfortable in actually providing active offer. They must also know to actually assist the client in obtaining language services once those language services are requested. It does little good to provide an active offer if one does not know the resources available to actually obtain services. There also likely needs to be some sort of active recruitment to increase language capability within the public service. I also can't stress enough that there needs to be a reintroduction of a high-level interpreter training program with some form of certification. This program should include specialization such as court and medical interpreting and translating. It is only with robust interpreting and translating programs that it is possible to actually allow the legislation to work. Further, after this overhaul is done and decisions are made as to how services will be put into effect, in my opinion, they shouldn't be guidelines. They should be regulations. They need to have some teeth. I fully appreciate that all these measures take money, and I appreciate that we're living in tough economic times. Nonetheless, we need to place value on these endeavors and put the money behind them to make them a reality. As part of a review of the Act, there also needs to be a review of the Minister responsible for official languages in that role. It's an important one, and I've had a good relationship with the Ministers who've held that position. That stated, I think consideration must be given to having a language bureau that is centralized, independent of any particular department, and answerable to those in the highest echelon. We have the French Language Secretariat, and I applaud the work of the folks there. And I want to thank Ben Watson Penn for his support over the years. However, why is there not an official language secretary? A place to obtain high level interpreting translation and interpretation services on the spot by highly trained interpreters and translators. A place to have questions answered quickly and efficiently. A place for the development of materials that are northern names and preserve and protect our language. A place to celebrate languages in a wholesome way. And a place for educational initiatives for government staff. There also needs to be a review of the role of my office. One of the things I've noticed is that people have difficulty understanding the role of the language commissioner. And I think that's been true over time, and, and that role has changed over time. We've had re requests to review curricula, to look at a teaching environment, to fund projects, things like that, clearly outside the scope of the office. I think there also needs to be consideration given to how the language commissioner can address issues. Right now, it's all in the form of recommendations, and that's positive. But one of the things I've taken into account in the past year and a half in particular is what I'm going to call, for lack of a better term, alternative dispute resolution. And I've been able to uh, get into a room, high-level government officials and complainants who look collaboratively to share stories and explore issues. The Act doesn't particularly provide for that. It doesn't say you can't. But I think the idea of uh, broadening that mandate should at least be considered. I want to briefly go through the annual reports. I, I, you, they're self-explanatory, um, and so I don't have too much to highlight in them uh, except for a few points. Um, 
One of the things I wanted to point out uh, is that I did have the privilege in December of 2018 completing a chapter in a book uh, called Constitutional Pioneers. And if you want to understand the principles that I believe should apply to the review of the Act, it's set out in that chapter. I speak about the fact that you can't understand language apart from culture, and I speak about the importance of language and passing on culture and tradition. I also had the pleasure of uh, attending uh, international and international events in those last two years. I had the privilege of appearing before the Senate Standing Committee on Indigenous Persons, and I was very pleased that the Legislative Assembly, the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment, and my whole office hosted an event at the AGM and Conference of the International Association of Language Commissioners in Toronto. Former Speaker Lafferty was the guest speaker that evening, and it was a real success that showcased our unique North. And I want to thank him and Premier Cochran, who was the Minister of Education, Culture, and Employment at the time. I also want to highlight, and I've said this before, that although there are not many complaints referenced in these reports, in my opinion, that's not a true reflection of what you hear in the community. Um, and I also just want to point out in my last annual report, which uh, is pretty much complete and will be tabled soon, I hope, um, there were 16 complaints this past year. And so we have seen a rise in complaints. Um, I'm still trying to get my head around that a little bit. I've got some ideas, uh, but certainly we have seen a rise in complaints. And that's a good thing as well. The last thing I'll mention is that I did indicate uh, in uh, the report that I would do, be doing a report on health genetics, essentially a follow-up to a report I had done many years ago. That will not be completed. But I, that's not a, what I'll call, uh, failed endeavor. Instead, when I was talking about having officials in a room talking about issues, um, that involved health, health officials. And so that has helped formulate some strategies and recommendations and changes along the way. So I want to uh, make that, I, what I'm hoping is that the new Languages Commissioner will continue on with that endeavor and I will share uh, where those things lie. In conclusion, I want to thank the Legislative Assembly for the privilege to act as Lands Commissioner. I also want to thank uh, the Legislative Assembly and the Premier for thoughtful consideration to some recommendations made by the office. I also want to wish the incoming Languages Commissioner the best of luck as they take on this role. There are many challenges ahead and we are definitely living in interesting times. However, I know Northerners are resilient and, I will continue, and will continue to address those issues. As we do address those challenges, I hope we can all commit to ensuring the language rights of Northerners are always in the forefront of proposed solutions and not an add-on or afterthought. Marcy. Thank you. Goldberg, we will now open the floor for questions and recognize our committee members first. Does anybody want to? Uh, Ryland? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Goldberg, for all of your work as language commissioners. I know you, you've been in this role a, a couple times. Um, yeah, I, I think I would largely agree with your comments that the, the act isn't working. Uh, you know, 2018, 2019, we had no complaints. So I, I, I think that speaks for itself. I, I was interested to hear that there have been an increase in complaints recently, and I do think that's a good thing. But I, I guess I want to speak to one of the problems I see. I, I don't necessarily disagree with any of what you said the changes of the Act need, but I think we could give our Indigenous language speakers the same rights as English and French right now, we could spend millions making sure every GNWT document is translated. We could spend millions making sure there's always interpretation available for all GNWT services. And, but I don't think that necessarily solves the underlying issue is that we could give all of our language speakers the best rights until the day that there are no language speakers left. And I feel like this act is kind of completely removed from actually creating new language speakers. Um, 
and so there's this tension I find, and spending money on interpretation and translation doesn't create, you know, languageness. It doesn't mean necessarily that kids are being educated and speaking the language at home. Um, and so I was wondering if there's any <laughs> examples you've come across that essentially give rights to indigenous peoples who are not language speakers, who want to learn their language, whether that would be a right to free courses, a right to educate their children in the language, whether they speak it. Um, because to me, that's really what I would like to see this act do. I would like to see this act take it in a direction that every year we are producing new language speakers, not just making sure our elders you know, have access to their services. So I'm wondering if you could give some thought to how we could do that with the Official Languages Act. Thank you, Madam Chair. Skullberg, do you want to answer that question? Yes. Sorry, I apologize again. Yes, I can. I'll make a few comments. Um, I think the first part is some of that just has to deal with educational initiatives. Um, so I, I and I would agree with you. Um, educational initiatives have to be such so that exactly what you're saying, you're not um, out just allowing a language to die out. And then you say, okay, I guess there's no speaker of that language anymore, so we're we're done with that. And I know I'm being crass and cynical when I say that, but I'm agreeing with your sentiment. I think a lot of that falls on the Department of Education, and I know they've done some tremendous work that way, because you need to build up the language speakers. I'm not sure legislation can do that so much as a robust education scheme, but in terms of actually protecting those rights, you've hit on another point, and that is that um, you've got to go back to the communities and say, what are your priorities? Where, because I agree, the idea of interpreting all documents and all of our languages, um, you could spend a whole bunch of money and be no further ahead. But where are the priorities? And so I'm going to give you an example. I think where you do want to do that is something like health care. So I think we're hard-pressed to say, I can get a brochure on, let's say, tuberculosis um, in English and French. I can't get it in Pletro. I don't think that can be justified. I think that you need to work with communities to say what things do uh, are, are a priority, and then work from there. And then that will, I think, as you move forward, um, help to keep those languages alive and vibrant. The people will see them in the community. And those services that they want, they will see them provided to the government in those languages. Want to follow up? Ryan? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and the other issue that I, I see is that I, I'm quite confident this this committee and the Department of Education, Culture and Employment and the Minister want to revise this act. They want to, you know, increase the rights, and, and I think that will be the outcome. But I, those rights only go so far if people aren't willing to use them. And, uh, you know, the French language community is very aware of their rights. They are very strong advocates. They will go to court if necessarily. They will win cases. And I think when we look at the history of this act, and the history of the rights under it, uh, indigenous language speakers, for whatever reasons, just do not exercise their rights in the same way that French language speakers do. Um, so if you could speak to ways that this office or perhaps education, culture, and employment could, you know, if we go in legislation, increase those rights, how do we make sure that people in the communities will actually exercise them? And I, I, So if you could speak to any kind of initiatives that can make sure that, you know, we will actually get more complaints, because I think that's one of the end goals at the end of the day. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mrs. Goldberg, would you want to give some oversight on that, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm going to go back to the chapter that I, I wrote, um, because I, it, I think it alludes to, to where you're going again. And what it, I talk about is the need when you're coming up with any language initiatives it is very, in my opinion, it's very paternalistic for me to tell an indigenous community, here is how we're going to preserve your language right. It's got to be the other way around, where you're consulting with those communities and elders to say, as I was saying, what are your priorities? What is it you'd like us to, to would you like to see to help keep those communities vibrant 
and alive. And I do believe that education really made a shift in the last few years uh, in my conversations with the folks over at EC, made a real shift more to that community uh, focus as well, so that you could work with communities and, and let them um, take some the initiative in terms of what was important to them as opposed to uh, the assembly or uh, government officials telling them, here's what should be important to you. And I know that's not what's intended here. And so I think uh, one of the things that has to be very evident, and when the act was reviewed before, I think the legislative assembly uh, really tried to do this, and not to get into the communities to to pick the brains of the elders uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where do you go? Are there any other questions? Keep it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you very much, Ms. Goldberg, for your time this evening and over the years as our Languages Commissioner. Um, just in follow-up to MLA Johnson's question, I, I guess what I'd like to know is um, what what do you see as the role of the Official Languages Commissioner as far as being able to play a role in engaging with communities to have that conversation about um, what communities would like to see as the role of the Languages Commissioner um, to be able to help create a, a conversation about how the Official Languages Commissioner can, um, can help the community and can uh, kind of like you say, flip that role around. And so I'm wondering how you see the Official Languages Commissioner being able to do that engagement uh, and how you saw your own role within communities as far as that's concerned. Thank you. Mrs. Goldberg. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, uh, one of the things that I did and it was to uh, try and get out to the communities. Um, and, I, and that can be a sensitive issue at times. You want to you know, make yourself known, you, but you don't want to um, go in without that plan. So, um, you know, when you, when you go in, for example, I'm going to give an example that uh, has a lot of meaning to me, and it, it makes me sad that it didn't happen this year, is uh, going to Anubic and then to a couple outlying communities there, like Toxiclavic, McPherson, uh, Sigachet, because... Um, I had done that three years in a row going to E3 school and uh, it was, I was always tried to plan at the beginning of the school year and actually got a call last year. Well, was I coming? And then was I coming to the college because they would expect you to come speak to uh, young people and, and, and to me there was just such positive energy at the college, at the school. And it gets people interested in their languages. So, to me, those were highlights, and as I said, it made it, made it sad uh, that that didn't happen this year. Um, but just those kind of things where you're, you're getting into the communities, I think, are important. I think in uh, another way, possibly, and this is probably going against certain rules or expectations of the assembly, but perhaps during the review, if they go out to um, community, perhaps the language commissioner is asked to go out as well uh, because they might come back with a different focus that they can then bring back uh, and share. Um, so that might be another way to, to uh, think about that as well. Um, certainly, and I allude to this in my reports and it's in my latest report as well, I, I absolutely agree that by and large, uh, Indigenous persons will not uh, file a complaint uh, for example, like the Francophone community has done. And I applaud the Francophone community for doing that. But I think there are different cultural realities. And so for some elders, they are not going to file a complaint. But they will sit and have a cup of coffee with you and tell them their concern. And they will tell you that they're concerned about whether their children are, are learning the language. And... Um, they will tell you their stories. And so, I, I, to me, that is just as valuable and it needs to be treated as such. So again, I think going into the communities, both the Legislative Assembly of the Act, 
and just as part of the mandate of the office, um, those things need to occur. One supplementary. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm I. I ha shared the same concerns as my colleague as well in regards to the uh, no complaints received by the Commission uh, for 2017-18 and 18-19. And then to hear in your opening remarks that there were 16 complaints this year, it definitely makes me um, look forward to the report being tabled in the Legislative Assembly. But I'm wondering if you can speak to commonalities between the 16 complaints that were received this year. Uh, in addition to what you believe may, be, may have driven that number up and encourage those complaints to come forward. Thank you. Mrs. Goldberg. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, in broad brush strokes, um, it, I would say it's still largely the Francophone community and then um, largely uh, related to health care. That is not a surprise. Um, and so, um, you know, to me, that, that's why, where this focus on health care uh, has to be. And I, I, I do want to um, just stress again the willingness of complainants and government officials to sit down and talk through issues. Um, I, I found astounding. I mean, astounding in a good way. And so, um, I, that's the sort of thing I would like to, to see. And that ability for, for somebody to feel like they were heard, I think that's important as well. So, um, it's difficult to say what it is, um, but it's a good thing. And, uh, you know, the New Language Commission will be interesting to see what happens next, but uh, it's good to see those things happen. Lisa? Uh, my, um, my question to, is, um, it's, is it working? Oh, it's too short. Can you hear me? talk really loud <laughs> all right um, I just wanted to and I know you addressed this in your opening remarks that um, so language should be treated equal to French and English and when you raised the issue of active offer I know I was very um, my previous career was part of the GNWT public service when active offer came into play um, <laughs> And now as an MLA, I'm still hearing the complaints in my community as an Inivialuit Gwich'in community. And like you mentioned, we're trying to we're trying to preserve and we're trying to make our language important, but even our frontline workers having to answer the phone to say hello, bonjour, not that there's any disrespect against the French language, but if we're giving an act of offer isn't the act of offer, shouldn't, couldn't it be, if I'm in Ivialuit and I want to say, you know, in my language, or if I'm Gwich'in and I want to answer the phone, Dringwinzi, you know, is that not okay as an act of offer? So that way, whether you're French or whatever language that you want, and I know that as a GNWT, the direction is, is you have to say, hello, bonjour, you know, and so you have Indigenous, even some of our elders who are frontline admin, having to answer this and they're feeling where is my language important in this because and again and you just mentioned it indigenous people are less likely to go forward and file a complaint and take this all the way to court so how is it that we as MLAs within like with the ability to change legislation to to ensure that um, that language is equal. The, the, the official languages of Northwest Territories are equal um, as English and French. And so if I want to answer the phone and I want to give the act of offer, I should be able to give it in any of the official languages as well. And if you want French, then, you know, as an Indigenous person, they can't speak French anyway. So if they answered in their own language, at least they're giving that language act of offer. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you want to just make some comments on that, uh, Mrs. Gilbert? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I, I think you've struck on a few issues there. Uh, the first one being it's not even that a matter of changing legislation. It's that the legislation does not deal with active offer. Um, the guidelines do, but they're soft, and they really don't give any detail. So that's the first point, is that there has to be something laid out that has more teeth in it, in my opinion. Secondly, and I want to be clear about this, um, the, the French Language Secretariat and, and uh, Benoit Buchanan shop, they have put together phenomenal materials in terms of active offer. This is, those are crisp, clear productions. Um, they're, they're, they're professional. Um, but it's a matter of taking that the next step and using that same sort of a high quality approach to indigenous languages as well. But that state, so that can be done. But that state, that's, that's not even half the issue in my opinion. Because the other half of the issue is that even somebody who says, well, I've done the training, um, you know, I know what active offer is, then the minute that somebody actually asks for the active offer, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond. They don't know what resources are available in their office. Um, they don't know how to access it. Even if they do, they're not quite sure how to access those resources, so on and so forth. So it falls apart very quickly. So what's the point of an active offer if somebody can't follow through? So, I mean, it could very well be uh, that it's an active offer uh, where, you know, it would be in, in the community, it would be English, French, and fleet let's say. And the expectation would be the same, that you would be able to provide that service in any of those languages. And again, I'm just going to go back to, you know, what everyone's talking about the cost associated with, associated with that. But I would say, well, what are the services that people really want? What are the ones that are important? The ones that there's an expectation, full stop, that the government would provide. And so then you focus on that. And in those cases, be it English, French, or an indigenous language, how do we make that work? And as I said, with technology, I think there are far fewer barriers to being able to provide those services. Supplementary. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh, I the just to add to I think uh, is just there is that problem, and and I think one of the things is is the frontline, and that's from what I've heard in the past is the frontline staff. You know, they're being told they're going to be audited, so you have to answer the phone and you have to do this, and you know, it's almost like this scare tactic that we're going to get sued by, you know, the, the francophone, you know, that's why we're doing, but it's, and I don't think that discussion has ever come around about the active offer and, you know, so, or given the option to say, if I want to answer it in any other language and have the tools ready, it was just, you have to answer the phone like this, and then you even see it on like you phone HR and the phone you have to they they'll say hi you've reached the desk of so-and-so and then there's a recording because they don't even know how to you know it's in French because they have to do it in French but you're doing these and you're doing this in communities that are predominantly losing their language in small communities so I, I just I find that it's it's frustrating this is this that area is very frustrating so So, Mrs. Goldberg, do you have just uh, a short insight on that, please? Sure. I mean, it, 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 thank you, Madam Chair. I do think there is some frustration with that, but I, I, I want to be clear that uh, the Francophone community has the right to ask for that service as well, as does, uh, you know, the, the Indigenous community should be asking for it. Um, I, I, I understand the frustration, um, but I think it goes back to revisiting the whole issue of active offer. How are we going to uh, logically 
uh, come up with a system that works. What are the barriers? And I think that does mean doing an audit with frontline staff about and getting honest answers. Where where do they feel uncomfortable? Where do they feel tripped up? Is it nerves? Is it not knowing the resources? What is it? You have to have a fulsome, honest discussion to get by that. And and I and I have heard the same sort of comments that you know they're afraid they're going to be audited. Well, an audit has to be part of that, but I, I wouldn't want to see that as punitive. I want to see that as developmental. And I, I really think stops like uh, the lang- French language secretary, they, these folks have the tools. They are capable of really assisting not only with an audit, but development of material. And, and without putting more work on their plate, you know, th- there's good resources out there. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mr. Bonnetrouge? Yeah. Yeah, Madam Chair. Um, I must say to you, Ms. Gulbert, for uh, presenting to us the two, two reports. Um, and uh, I, I note that you're, you're, you're outgoing. You're going to be... Uh, leaving the position and uh, leaving uh, a report and some recommendations. Um, And it's great that you recognize that the indigenous languages are dying out. Um, I was involved with the Decho leadership uh, quite a while back and they also did a language wheel within their organization or the 13 organizations in the Decho First Nations. And it was noted that um, the language was dying. Uh, the fluent speakers were becoming less and less almost every year. Um, so there was a real push, I guess, in, in other languages too, to, uh, to incorporate languages into the schools. And now we have, uh, in my community anyways, Fort Providence, we've got uh, the immersion programs where the languages are taught up to grade four before English is even taught. So, And then there's also the adult language revitalization program in partnership with uh, uh, the school in Victoria. And that's becoming... Uh, the degree program. So there's been push anyways to revitalize the language in, in every aspect. Um, um, I don't know if I introduce myself as uh, Ron Bonadrus uh, for MLA for Techo, just to let you know. Um, but there's lots of concerns coming out of my communities because I represent the majority indigenous Dene people. And in our communities, we always say, you know, why are we losing this language war to the French-speaking people? This territory, the Northwest Territories, is majority indigenous territory. You look up and down the geography of the Northwest Territories, that's what you see. And like I said in my previously, that my people are wondering how come the French have more rights in language than we do, as Dene people. Everything's being translated to French. You're answering phones, government, doing everything in French. I also note too, and I was looking at the Stanton Hospital even the large sign outside is, is in French. And you're in the traditional territory of the Quechua Dene people, the Yellow Knives Dene First Nations. It's not even translated in that language. And I guess it, you know, it stems from the fact that, well, they weren't taking anybody to court. Those are the real questions that 
or concerns that are always brought to my attention, uh, even before I come become a, an MLA. I know we're going to be challenged to fight off other languages that are probably going to come up from the south. Um, I just I just thought I would like to mention that and. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. I don't know if there was any recommendations to your next, your successor or whatnot in terms of some of these issues, but uh, I thought I would just mention that. Masi. Thank you, Mr. Bon Cruz. Uh, uh, Mrs. Goldberg, do you just want to make a statement on Mr. Bon uh, comments, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as I indicated, I mean, when the legislation was developed, uh, very, uh, English and French were given equ uh, equality. Um, I don't want to see the French language rights uh, broken down or eroded. I don't think that's helpful to anybody. I applaud the Francophone community for the steps they've taken. What I want to see is the indigenous languages built up. And I, I think that uh, one of the things that could happen is more dialogue and communication between uh, French language speakers and indigenous language speakers, because some of the struggles are the same. And was just over a year ago, I think almost exactly a year ago, I had the pleasure of speaking to the Federation Franco Tenwa at their ACM. And it was very well put together. But they had uh, some indigenous speakers there to speak about their challenges as well. And it was, I, I thought it was a, a, a smart move on everybody's part. And it really highlighted that some of the struggles are the same. They've been approached differently, but the struggles are nonetheless there. So I guess I would just end that off by saying I don't want to see French language rights eroded. I want to see Indigenous languages rights built up. Are there any non-committee members in attendance? No? Okay. So uh, we don't have any other uh, questions. And uh, I just want to just make a couple of things. I just want to, as chair, uh, just just make a couple of comments. Uh, you don't have to answer these, just so we have them for the record. I think that uh, now that we're going to be looking at redoing the uh, the Languages Act, uh, one of the things that we have to strive for is to ensure that all 11 languages are treated equally in the territories. I think that uh, one of the things you mentioned that was really important was the interpreter training program must be reestablished. Uh, the linguistics in, uh, and the learning in the interpreter training program was part of the Aurora College uh, and I don't know why they got rid of that uh, years ago because it was a very successful um, uh, course and uh, some of the uh, interpreters downstairs within the legislature have already mentioned they're all getting older and uh, they mentioned the interpreter training program that they took at, uh, at Aurora College in order to do the job that they're doing today. And the consideration of a language barrel, an independent uh, secretariat, um, I think that is, uh, is also interesting. I, I'd have to see if, it, if it's a proper thing for uh, preservation of Aboriginal languages, but uh, it's something to think about. And uh, those are some of the observations that I made uh, during, uh, during your uh, talk, and I want to thank you for that. And so with that, seeing that there's no more questions, Mrs. Gil Gilbert, do you have any final remarks, sir? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just say thank you to all of you for your time this evening. Uh, and I wish you well in your deliberations as you review the act. Um, it's, that, that's obviously going to be a challenge to do. And I uh, uh, just want to thank the Legislative Assembly again for the privilege of uh, being in this position uh, over the last few years. Merci.
Thank you, Mrs. Goldberg, for your years of service to the Assembly and the residents of the Northwest Territories as Official Languages Commissioner. You have played an important role in the protection of language rights in the Northwest Territories, and I really want to thank you for that. Good night. Lots of work to do if they're going to make that change. Okay. So we'll go back in camera now just to finish our agenda.